Okay, this morning I want to, um, to recap for a wee bit on last week. I want to focus on some of the things that the Lord has been highlighting to us. In other words, the Lord is telling us to clear the way, if you like, for the glory to come. We're going to look at the opposers of the will of God. We're also going to discover a simple solution to defeat and destroy every power that rages against us. We want to live in the freedom that Jesus brings us, folks. And the truth sets us free. My title for the message today is Greater Grace is Our Freedom Cry. His Greater Grace is Our Freedom Cry. Last week my focus was on changing the atmosphere. Change it from something that can resist the Lord, resist the presence of the Lord, to one that creates the atmosphere for the presence and the glory of God to come into our own lives and corporately as a church. I said last week that we need to create or cultivate a culture of revival within our own lives and within the fellowship. This is something the Holy Spirit is determined to use or to work with us to give us fresh revelation on how we're going to do it. There are different elements to this. These are elements that are not unfamiliar to us, but God has been telling us He needs to bring things into a higher level than ever before. And the Lord has told us that. He's taken us into higher places. So we need to understand, Lord, what is going on here. This is going to affect our praise. This is going to affect our worship, our prayers, our prophetic declarations, and so on. The words that we've received through the Lord through our tarrying times, as I said last week, they are prophetic. In other words, God has given us a whole lot of information. He says, now you need to work on the information I've given you. That's what the prophets did. When God gave them information, they were to work with it and use it to proclaim to the nation of Israel and so on. We have this foretelling or future telling thing or promises from the God that we need to believe and we need to declare into being, we need to pray them into being so that they are actually become part of our physical world. I have spoke to you also about the resistance that the Lord showed me in this wrought iron fence that I encountered during the time of prayer. How God revealed this to me as a, as a fence that resists or opposes the will of God for my life. It was a barrier. And the Lord was saying, you need to have this thing removed. You need to break through this to go deeper and to go further in me. It brought to mind instantly 2 Corinthians 10 verses 35. For though we wage war, we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. This fence or this stronghold is defined here as arguments, high things, exalted, exalted things, Things that affect our willingness to discover the will of God for our lives and to walk in obedience to it. That's what they rage against us. That's their whole purpose. Our own sinful nature does not want us to fulfill God's plan for our lives and to walk in obedience to that. It's these three attitudes of the mind or the soulless realm, the intellect, the will and the emotions, they actively resist the truth. And the will of God for us. An example is given to us in 2 Timothy 1 7, where it speaks of how the spirits of the enemy will use those parts of us to their greatest advantage. God has not given us, for example, a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I heard a prophet of God the other day, and he said this fear will mess up your mind. Fear will mess up your mind, but God has given us a sound mind. Amen. And these are the kind of things that we battle with. These are the kind of things we've got to declare over our own lives. 
I do not submit to the spirit of fear, Father, because I have a sound mind in Jesus Christ. This is where our warfare takes place, folks. By totally renouncing and rejecting what the devil tries to do in our lives. We must know how to dismantle and destroy every opposer to the will of God. In Romans 8.15, Paul says this again. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba Father. Fear brings us into bondage. The word for bondage here is the Greek word douleia or dulia. And it speaks of the condition of being a slave. The condition of being a slave. And the apostles instructed in Christians, do not allow yourself to become a slave again to fear. Because this is a spirit that seeks to dominate your life. And it will mess up your head. But Paul goes on and he gives us the antidote for this one. He tells us how to defeat the spirit of fear. You receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba Father. In other words, knowing that we have been adopted into God's house, into the Father's house, is meant to be the cure for us. But it's not just the knowledge that gives us the cure, it's what we do with this knowledge. What do we do? Paul tells us, we cry out, Abba Father. We cry out, Abba Father. We get our dad on the job. Amen. We look the devil in the face, the spirit of fear and says, I'm getting my dad onto you. Look out. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Amen. It's wonderful. Our Father has the answer. Our Father is the answer. Yes. Because what Father can do is the answer. Amen. The spirit of fear causes us to submit our minds to these three strongholds. Arguments, high things, exalted things. The things our human nature will lean towards. You know, the human nature thinks and believes itself to be wiser than God. Yeah. Very often. Yeah. I know better. It talks us out of dealing with issues or dealing with the barriers to the will of God. It is spiritually unconcerned and it is spiritually lazy. That's the truth. The devil uses these to enslave us. Gets us all tangled up with arguments, high things, exalted things. And that in itself brings in the other side of the coin which is pride. Pride, which is the first sin, opposes God. Pride and fear, probably two of the devil's greatest weapons against humankind, but also against the church. The Apostle John, in his epistle, 1 John chapter 2, says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Can you see how this whole aspect of the sinful nature is seeking for us to not do the will of God? And that's the way the world operates. But John also points to the antidote. To worldliness. He who does the will of God. That's the antidote. To worldliness. He who does the will of God. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All are opposed to you, to you fulfilling God's plan for your life. So many who profess to be followers of Jesus have fallen, sadly fallen foul of these very things. Many come, you know, many come to church, but it's, a, it's coming to church only it's like a habit or it's even a social event. Some get bored or decide this is too hard. Some take offense and return to the world again. We've seen it so often. Jesus graphically put it like this. They're like a dog who returns to their vomit. Like a sow who, after being cleaned up, 
returns to wallowing in the mud. They return to wallow and delight in the filthiness of sin. And end up worse than they ever were before. Remember what Jesus said, when a spirit goes out from someone, they're being delivered. Say it was a spirit of fear. And it goes away to dry places, arid places. And then it comes back to see how this person has gone on. If that person has just lingered around and just hung around and done nothing with their newfound faith, that spirit goes and gets seven other spirits more wicked than itself and comes back and just inhabits that person again and their condition is worse than it ever was before. How terrible. We can never allow ourselves to ever go there, folks. When God gives you a revelation for your life or God gives you or speaks to you about something, even about this subject today, you need to lay hold of it. Lay hold of it and say, I'm taking ground here. I am taking ground today. Because if we're going to move into higher places in God, we have to be people who are determined to take ground and hold it. Yes? Amen. Surely. Yeah. We don't give the devil an inch. We just don't. John includes pride in this list. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Because it's the pride of life or these things that attach us to the world. He says that this aspect of the sinful nature has a power to cause us to love the world. He also goes on to say that if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. This is the power of the strong fence the Lord revealed to me. This is the resistance of that thing. And it means that the pride as well as fear are things we must surely wage war against. If we are to invite the glory into our midst, Romans 6, 12 says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Sin wants to dominate us. Fear wants to dominate us. Pride wants to dominate us. Rule over us to be our master and at the same time remove Jesus from being our master. The enemy seeks to displace Christ from being King and Lord of our lives. The New Bible Dictionary, speaking of this verse, says this. This is a phrase which describes the emotions of the soul, the natural tendency towards evil, and the inconsistency it is with the will of God. Our sinful flesh is inconsistent with the will of God. James 4 verse 5 says this. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. God is jealous for your love. He, he yearns and is jealous for your love. He's jealous for your, for your passion for Jesus. He's jealous for all that we should be in Christ. But he gives us more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Pride itself is inconsistent with the will of God. It is a lust of the sinful nature. And if we are given to its lusts, the outcome is given right here. God will resist us. No glory of God for the proud. No glory of God for the proud. No matter how much we pray for it, no matter how much we fast or, or, or do whatever we've done for it, if we've got a proud heart, God will resist us. That's just the reality and that's the truth. And that's why God is saying, Hamish, this is why I had to break through that barrier because the Lord showed me this, 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 and this. I said, Lord, I want rid of that. Well, I had to wage war against it. We're going to do something today. At the end of this meeting, we're going to do something today that is going to cause us to understand the simple way that God, the key that God has given us to overcome all of these things. Or do we think we're really overcoming them all? <laughs> We shall see. When we read your passage at the end of this, and you, you will see yourself, you can make up your own mind. Fear and pride are both inconsistent with the will of God. Resist us to his plans, and they will always oppose, always oppose him. Remember what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
and with all your soul and with all your strength. This means that the soulish part of us, the intellect, the world and the emotions, must love the Lord with all that it has to give. It's included there. But the soul is where the problem is. The soul is where the intellect, the will and the emotions. And we know what our emotions can be like. Someone doesn't even look at us, or someone fails to, to acknowledge us in the street. How quickly, how quickly do our emotions rise up? And yet we have to love God with our emotions. Oh, well, Pentecostals are good for that. They jump about it. Yeah, well, you know, maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe because we're passionate for Jesus. Maybe we dance before the Lord because our emotions are under the love of God. And we display them. We display our love for Him. And we dance and rejoice before Him. When you do that as an act of worship to God, then you know that your emotions have come under the authority of Jesus Christ and not the sinful nature. But if you can't rejoice, if you can't express your love for Him, if it's the chosen frozen spell, then your emotions are not in line with the Word of God. You're still bound up in fear. You're still bound up. Your emotions are still not free to rejoice and delight in Him. Heaven is a loud place, folks. Read the Bible. It is a loud place. There is rejoicing all the time. The only time it says there was silence, it was only for half an hour. I mean, that must have been like an eternity for them in heaven. Shut up for half an hour. Oh no, how are we going to do this, Lord? Come on. Come on, our rejoicing, our praise and our worship God is going to take them to new levels. And we will lift this roof. That's where we're going. But we need to be free before we can get there. Yes? All your soul. Love Him with all your soul. Hallelujah. This means that our soul is to love God. But this is where the war rages, doesn't it? Pride and fear. The Bible says we must put them to death. In Romans 7, Paul says this, verse 21, I then find a law that evil is present with me. The one who wills to do good, for I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man, according to his spirit, he wants to do what's right, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. The sin within us has a number one target, and that is for us to disobey God's will. The Bible tells us it's enmity to God. What does that mean? Enmity is a deep and bitter hatred shared between enemies, and it is not easily ended between the two or more parties. Deep and bitter hatred, that's that's what the soulish realm, that's what the sinful nature is like. It's a hatred for everything that God wants to do. And it will furiously attack our obedience to Christ. Paul is left at war with his own mind. That which seeks to dominate him. Who will rule in your life, Paul? Who governs your life? Will you allow the sinful nature? Or did you find a solution? Of course he found a solution. O wretched man that I am. Verse 24. Who will deliver me from this body of death? The body of death is a description of a fruitless Christian life. He said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus delivers him. And he delivers us. How does he do that? How do we overcome things like pride and fears and all the other stuff that goes on? Colossians 3 verse 5 says this, Therefore put to death your members, which on the earth, then he gives a list, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry, because these things, 
the wrath of God is coming upon those sons of disobedience. Paul describes these, these things as idolatry. Idolatry. Why is it idolatry? Because we are bowing the knee to something other than God. We are bowing the knee to demonic entities. Each of these things, believe it or not, each of these, fornication, uncleanness, evil passion, evil desire, covetousness, all of these are the names of evil spirits, evil identities. They're not just things that people do, they are promoted by evil spirits. If you've had anything to do with the deliverance ministry, you'll know this to be true. Idolatry. Even fear is idolatry. Why? Because it means we're bowing down the spirit of fear instead of trusting our Lord God Almighty. The world has been encapsulated by fear just now. Why? Because it's God is not able to protect. And so that fear becomes idolatry. Because we bow the knee to that. We don't bow the knee to fear. We attack it with the weapons that God has given us. Yes? What do we do then? How do we escape all of this? Well, he tells us, put to death your members. Everything that opposes our obedience to God. Put to death evil desires. How do we do that? First Kings 18, verse 42, or the second part, 42b, as we would say, gives us the answer. It says, Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, then he bowed down to the ground and put his face between his knees. This is the key. This is God's, I, I believe, God's most powerful word to us. This is the single thing that, that can decimate and totally destroy all of these sinful flesh things in our lives. Hatred, enmity, fear, pride, unforgiveness, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. God's one single truth can decimate all of them, can destroy all of them. It's God's number one primary weapon against the devil. Every opposing voice, every demonic thing, every part of the sinful nature, even the devil himself. Remember what happened to Jesus before he started his ministry. Just to give you an example, what does the Bible say? The Spirit drove him into the desert, right? And he was there for 40 days without food. What did the devil do? He waited until the 40 days were over, and then he approaches Jesus, and he tempts him. Turn these stones into bread. Because the Bible said Jesus hungered. The devil had no idea what he was doing for us. He had no idea that after 40 days of fasting, the authority and the spirit of Jesus was so powerful, so powerful, that the Bible says after the 40 days, he returned in the power of the spirit. Amen. If the devil wanted to tempt him, he should have came maybe a few days in. Or even at the start, he did not realize that after day after day after day, Jesus' spirit was getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. Why? Because he did what Elijah did. He humbled himself before Almighty God, and the grace of God just poured in, just poured in, just poured in, just poured in. The enabling power of God just poured in and poured in. The devil had no clue what was going on. He should have. 
God's grace, God's power just continued day after, just rolled on day after day until it came to a place where Jesus had done in the power of the Spirit. The devil got it all wrong. Jesus humbled himself before the Lord. And herein lies our most powerful key to our revival glory. Right here. Right here. Elijah climbs to the top of the mountain. No doubt you could see for miles around, but he wasn't there to take in the view. He was there to seek the face of God. And the best way he knew to do that, to get results, was to humble himself before the Almighty. Because a humble heart draws God's Holy Spirit to us like a moth to a flame. Proverbs 3.34 says this, Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. <clears throat> James 4.6 He gives more grace, therefore he says God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This truth is our victory truth. It's our victory truth. One single thing that we humble ourselves before Almighty God. That's why pride has to go. It has to go. We have to deal with these things a death blow. What is grace? <clears throat> the word grace itself in the Old Testament is God's favour, yes. God's unmerited favour, yes. In the New Testament, it's the word charis. That which bestows or occasions pleasure, delight, or causes favourable regard. 2 Corinthians 9 8. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. This is an aspect of God's grace that is an enabling force for ministry and obedience. Romans 1.5, listen to this, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. In both of these passages, God's grace is bestowed upon people so they may be enabled to accomplish every good work. In Paul's case, he says, even my apostleship. And also, this is God's call to ministry for all those of us here. We're all called to be ministers, yes? So it's for every good work, but also our obedience to the faith. In other words, our obedience to walk in righteousness before God. This is the grace of God. This is what it's given for. Let me return to James chapter 4 again, please. In verse 4, where do we war and fight? Or where do the wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desire for pleasure, the war in your members? You lust and you do not have. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. But listen to this, verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Look at verse 6 again. But he gives more grace. More grace. In the original Greek language, this means to be given a greater grace. <clears throat> a greater grace. In other words, the biblical definition of grace is to be enabled to accomplish every good work and obedience to the faith it's a deposit of God's power to change us from the inside out. It speaks into our service for the Lord as co-workers with Christ. But it also enables us to overcome the worldly lifestyle. To overcome the flesh, the sinful nature, the evil lusts, the pride and the fears of God or something else in mind. He gives us more grace. Greater grace. The Apostle Paul was a serious persecutor of the church. And yet God gave him grace to become an Apostle of Christ. In dealing with worldliness, he gives us more grace. He 
gives us more grace. Do you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? This is the context of verse 6. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The whole thing has got to do with <clears throat> our fight with the lust of the flesh. And it says, but he gives more grace. That's the context. God gives us more grace to deal with the sinful nature. Do you see that? A greater grace. A greater grace. So I can cry out to the Father, I want a greater grace, Father, to deal with this. To deal with my sinful nature. I want a greater grace. We're going to cry out. We're going to ask God today for this. Folks, I want to tell you, this wasn't the message I was going to preach today. I had already almost completed my message when I sat down at my computer again and the Holy Spirit said to me, you've forgotten about the fence. And I said, yeah, but we want to move on. I said, you've forgotten about the fence. If we don't deal with the fence, mm -hmm. and I don't mean offense, if we don't deal with the fence, then we will never move ahead with what God wants us to do. Mm -hmm. Because it's what's part of the fence that is opposing us doing what God wants us to do. What do we think we've got all together? We don't have all together, folks. We're still walking in fear. We're still walking with pride. We're still walking with all the things of the flesh. And Jesus says, the reason you're not doing what I want you to do is because you can't. Have you tried it? Yes, we've tried it. Have you taken every opportunity God has given you to share the gospel with somebody? No, we haven't. Why? Because we're fearful. We haven't put to death that misdeed of the flesh. We aren't able to do it, folks. Because your flesh cannot obey God. It won't. It's got a bitter hatred for God. How is it going to happen, Lord? Greater, greater grace. We cry, Abba, Father. I get my dad on the job. He gives greater grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. This overcoming, folks, is essential. We have got a harvest to bring in. We know that. But I am not going out into the harvest field until I've dealt with some stuff. Try it and see. I'm going to read you a passage from the New Testament, and you'll be able to decide for yourself how you would have handled what Jesus said to his disciples on this occasion. We're going to finish with this. Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Jesus called the twelve disciples together, gave them power and authority over all demons and cured diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not even take two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. Whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testament against them. So they departed, they went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. And many of us here today could do this. Come on, be honest with your own heart. In Luke 10, Jesus sends out the 70 with similar instructions. These people return rejoicing and say, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. <coughs> have you ever confronted a demon? Some of us have. Truly all of us actually have. Because we fight them every day. But if you've ever prayed for someone when a demon begins to manifest itself, that's a different story. Because that thing will resist you. And if you don't know your authority in Jesus Christ, that thing will defeat you. Because it knows whether you have the faith to cast it out or not. And it will challenge you. Surely it will. 
So folks, if we rush ahead of the Holy Spirit in this one, we're going to fail. We're going to fall flat on our face. Because we're not ready. And if you think you're ready, then praise God, go out and do it. Because you'll get no opposition from me. Just go do it. And come back rejoicing. Come back with a message and a report that says, I did this and I preached the gospel and I healed the sick and I drove out devils and I'm rejoicing. And we will rejoice with you. But until we have the confidence and the word of God to do that in our own hearts, we will rush ahead of him. I'm not going to rush ahead of the Holy Spirit. I've done that too often. I'm not doing it anymore. Jesus says go, Hamish will go. But this is what God is saying to us just now as a church. You've got to deal with pride. You've got to deal with fear. You've got to deal with this and you've got to deal with that. You have a fence that needs to come down. And the only way it's going to come down is when you humble yourself before Almighty God. And you may be saying, well, how do I even do that? Well, next week I will tell you how. But for today, I'd like us to stand. I'd like us to stand. Bless you, Lord. We're going to ask the Lord for greater grace. You may want to, to rattle off a list before the Lord in your own heart. But today I want us to, to look at that fence, to look at those things that oppose the will of God in our lives. Whether it be fears, whether it be pride, whether it be, you know, who knows? You know. You know your heart before God. Just focus in on these things just now. I'm going to give you a minute or so, a couple of minutes to do that. And then we're going to pray. And we're going to invite God's greater grace to begin to operate and begin to touch our lives and begin to break through that thing. I'm going to pray, we're going to renounce these things in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, today we come to Abba, Father. We cry out to our dad today. Because that's what you said. Cry Abba, Father. You are our daddy. And Father God, we offer up all our worldliness, all our fears, pride, resistance, self-will, everything that opposes your will. We renounce all of these things. We recognize, Lord, that there's a barrier between us and moving on into the things of God, the greater things that you have for us. We take authority over that fence today. We take authority over these things today. And we lay a hold of you, Father God. We renounce them. We bind and break the power of the enemy, Lord God, that would infuse them, that would build them up in our lives. We bind the enemy of our souls in Jesus' name from off of all of these things. And we break through. We break through those barriers today. And in doing so, Father, we cry out to you today for the greater grace to do this. The greater grace. The greater grace. The greater grace to overcome all the things in the flesh that would oppose the will that you have for us. 